Well, good morning to all. Pleasant Sabbath to you. And I hope you would have had a good week and will have, have been having and will continue to have a great and enjoyable Sabbath day. We have just come out of our annual camp and uh, from all reports, um, spirits have been buoyed. People have been encouraged. The challenge is to keep the blessing up and don't let it drop. We must seek God's grace to ensure that we do not allow the blessing to drop. I'm pleased to be able to present to you today the message which is the first of several, hopefully. The theme is the new covenant in Old Testament times. The sub-theme is complete salvation for the worst of sinners. That's something we can hold on to, and I shall be commencing that today. At this time, before we have our opening prayer, I want to invite you to read with me, stand and read with me the scripture reading for the day from your Bibles, and it is taken from Jeremiah chapter 31, reading from verses 31 to 34. I invite you to stand and read responsively, responsively, and uh, after that we shall pray, after that we shall be treated to an item of special music um, by the senior choir. By the chorale. And there will also be an item of special music by Sister Nicole Joseph. So we'll be treated to two items of special music, one by the chorale and one by Sister Nicole Joseph. We have um, God has great blessings in store for us today. At this time, I just want to extend uh, another welcome to those who are with us today, visiting for the first time or otherwise. Um, just two brief notes. Um, for the last two or three Sabbaths, you know, Brother Stout, Cameron Stout is home ill. Um, the, the illness has taken strong hold of his body, but it has not affected his mind or his spirit. He is still strong in spirit, praising God. Um, the, those of us who normally attend the prayer meeting on Wednesday nights, um, we went by him the last Wednesday night, and uh, he was happy to see us. His handshake is still fairly firm. And he still has his smile, smiling broadly to see us. When it was over, he said, he smiled and said, that was beautiful. Um, he, he has wanted to be with us the last two or three Sabbaths, but it, it has not worked out for him. Obviously, he wouldn't be able to spend very much time. Um, he would come in a wheelchair, but he, he hasn't been able to make it. Nevertheless, they are following on the internet. So we hope that they receive a good um, feed today. And uh, Sister Rosalind Crony, whom it was announced, um, was ill last week. Um, we are told that she is improving, and things are much better with her as well. So if she is, is, if she is following us on the internet, Sister Crony, we wish you God's blessing and speedy recovery and return to us. All right, so at this time, I invite you to stand and uh, let us read the scripture reading. Please stand. Jeremiah 31. Thirty-one to thirty-four, we shall read responsively. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, 
that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father, it gives us pleasure to approach thy throne of grace today to meet with you and with our high priest, Jesus, in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. We thank you and we praise you for this blessing. We ask you to be with us today as we as your word is presented, as it is heard, may your angels and your spirit come close to teach us, to fill us, to strengthen us, to uplift us. May it be presented with clarity and understanding, and may it be received with the clarity and understanding and the assurance of your love for us and your great purpose toward us. Bless everyone who is here. Bless those who could not be here today. Remember Brother Stout and his illness, those who are shut in. Sister Rosen as well. Bless everyone, bless each individual, every family, every child that all may receive of you today in Jesus' name. Amen. We shall now have our items of special music.
Pleasant Sabbath to all. The hymn I'm about to sing is number 452, What Heavenly Music. Apparently, the first Adventist pioneers sang this hymn a lot because it reminded them or it helped them think more about heaven and how the angels are singing. So I hope you will all be transcended as you hear the words of this hymn.
Well, we want to thank God for those beautiful items of special music. And um, if you're observant, you'll notice that I don't have a jacket. It's because of the heat. I've had to dispense with it. If you didn't notice, my apologies. The New Testament, the New Covenant in Old Testament times. Complete salvation for the worst of sinners. We want to begin with some definitions. What is a covenant? <clears throat> the covenant can be an agreement. It can be a contract. Another word used is compact, C-O-M-P-A-C-T. A covenant can be a promise. It can also be a commitment. And a covenant can be also double-sided, that is between two persons or two parties. It can be multi-sided, that is between several persons or several parties. And it can be one-sided, made by one person or party. Among all those, which category does God, God's covenant fit into? Double-sided? God's covenant, the covenant that we call the new covenant, is it multi-sided? No? Is it double-sided? No? No? Is it one-sided? Yes. God's covenant. We want to look at the concept of old covenant versus new covenant. And we're looking at Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 to 13. Reading. But now hath he, Christ, obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. As, you, as we read this passage, we are going to come across some terms referring to either the old covenant or the new covenant. And I want you, as you read, to observe because we are going to ask a couple of questions when we finish, when we finish reading this passage, as to which term refers to which covenant. So we are told that Christ has obtained a more excellent ministry by, much also, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place should have been sought for the second for finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. What will, I, what, will he, what will he do? He says, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Sounds to me like a time is coming, God is setting it up to do away with preachers. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. 
in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. That's the concept of old covenant versus new covenant. And I want to go through a little exercise here to see if in the passage we've read, we can identify the terms which refer to the old covenant and those which refer to the new. Okay. So first we look at the term, a better covenant. It said that Christ is the mediator of a better covenant. Is that the old covenant or the new? New. That first covenant, also mentioned in the passage, that first covenant, old or new? Old. No place would have been sought for the second, old or new? Can I hear it? New. The one that is termed the second is the new. Okay. A new covenant. You sure you want to answer? New. The covenant that I made, he says, the, the new covenant will not be according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. The covenant that I made, that God made, said he made with their fathers in the day that he took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. The covenant that I made with their fathers, old or new? You sure? Okay. You sure? Old. My covenant, they continued not in my covenant, old or new? Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not. Which covenant they broke? The same one that they made, the old. They made it and broke it, the old. The covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, old or new? New. A new covenant. Okay. Good. So we identify the references to the old and new covenants in the um, book of Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 to 13. The first, old or new? In these references, first refers to old. Okay. Now, we've talked about Old Covenant and New Covenant, and we're saying that the, the one is called the first, and it's also called the old, and one is called the second, or the new. But what we want to establish here is that the New Covenant actually existed before the old. Is that confusing? Surprising? Well, it's because you're not, if you're not familiar with it, then it would be confusing or surprising. But we want to establish then that the new covenant actually existed before the old. Okay. The covenant described as the new covenant was inextric is inextricably bound with the plan of salvation. Therefore, it went into operation the moment Adam sinned so that our first parents could have a way of escape from the chains of sin. Now, what would have happened if when Adam sinned, there was no covenant? Would have been totally lost. So, it means then that even before Adam sinned, there was the, um, the preparation and the position and the provision of that covenant. So that the minute he sinned, because if the minute he sinned, 
there was nothing to intervene. There was no intercession. There was no go between. He would have been totally lost. We would have been totally lost. So the minute Adam sinned, there was a covenant bound up with the plan of salvation that went into effect immediately so that our first parents could have a way of escape from the chains of sin. And this covenant was intimated to Adam and Eve in the words spoken by God to the serpent in Genesis 3.15. And what were those words? God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, the woman's seed, and thou shalt bruise his seed. Were those words spoken to Adam and Eve? Or to the serpent? They were spoken to the serpent, but in those words, Adam and Eve received a message. Um, okay. I suspect that I may have been given the, um, the wrong copy. Anyhow, we shall proceed. The Lord said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, if, if, if there's any way that we can get the change made um, without any trouble, we, we shall see what can happen. Anyhow, he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And in that message, in that statement made to the serpent, Adam and Eve found hope for salvation. Now, some people wonder if Adam and Eve were saved. Well, the message is, that the message of salvation and the plan of salvation in those words were opened up to Adam and Eve. And they found hope and they found salvation through that promise because they realized, well, look, the seed of the woman would be who? Jesus Christ. And therefore, they saw in that statement the plan of salvation in Jesus Christ. And Adam and Eve found hope of salvation and they actually found salvation in Jesus Christ. And the plan of salvation was also presented to them in the sacrificial system which the Lord instituted to them at that time. So Adam and Eve had with them an understanding of the new covenant, the covenant in which was instituted the plan of salvation and they took advantage of that covenant to make their calling and election sure. Amen. Good. Now, also, Adam and Eve would have presented... Okay, we'll see. Ah, different copy. This is a new covenant now. In this utterance, Adam and Eve saw the plan of salvation in Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman. They also saw it in the sacrificial service which God instituted for them. Thus, they were able to make their calling and election sure. And the new covenant was later more fully elaborated to Abraham, the father of the faithful. So, people talk about dispensations. And how people were saved in the old days and how people were saved in the new days. The truth is that people were saved and are saved the same way throughout history. And that is by the new covenant, the plan of salvation. One plan of salvation so that it was given to Adam and Eve and those who came after them also received that plan from Adam and Eve. And then it was more fully elaborated to Abraham, the father of of the faithful. The new covenant in Old Testament times. 
The next covenant, the covenant called the Old Covenant, was made at Sinai when the children of Israel were on their way from Egypt to the Promised Land. And uh, it was called the First Covenant because it was the first of the two to be ratified by blood sacrifice. Now, a covenant in those days had to be ratified. In other words, it had to be given its legality. You know when you can, you can sign a contract, you can sign a deed or whatever, but it must go before the court to be given legality. So the old covenant, although it came second, it was given its legality first, and that was ratified by blood sacrifice at Sinai, which we shall see. And that was centuries before even Abraham lived. On the other hand, the new covenant, which existed first, was not ratified until centuries later when Christ died on the cross of Calvary. Are we clear? One is called the Old Covenant, but that came first. One is called the New Covenant, but that came second. They are called first, and the old one is called the first, sec first covenant, and the new one is called the second covenant. But it was called first because it was ratified first, not because it existed first. And the other one was called second because it was ratified second, not because it existed second. You see the change. Good. Everybody clear then? Uh, mistake there. Abraham was before saying it. That's correct. Serious mistake. Anyhow, um, I can't correct it now, so. Thank you. A closer look at the Old Covenant. Quoting from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 371, another compact, notice the word compact, called in Scripture the Old Covenant was formed between God and Israel at Sinai and was then ratified by the blood of a sacrifice. We'll take a look now and see this covenant being put into place. Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 to 8. Children of Israel coming out of Egypt. In the third month, coming out of Egypt, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai, so they before Mount Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel camped before the Mount Sinai. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. That's God speaking. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. That's the, that's the word from the Lord. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And what happened? What happened? And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So you see the people there making a promise. Okay. All that the Lord has said, we will do. Okay. Now, after Moses had gone up into the mount and received the Ten Commandments, the, 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 sorry, the Lord had spoken the Ten Commandments in the hearing of all the people, Moses came back down and told the people the words of the Lord and all the judgments. These are the things that the instructions the Lord had given him. And all, the, so this is the second time now, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, what? We will do. So it's the second time they promised to do what the Lord said. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill 
and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. So we see now that covenant being set in place. And he sent young men of the children of Israel which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings and oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar and he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people and they said, what again? All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. So the people promising, promising, promising to obey the Lord. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. So that was the making of the old covenant at Sinai. And notice it involved the promises of the people. The problem with the old covenant then was the people and their promises. We're quoting them from Patriarchs and Prophets 3, 71, 72. God brought them to Sinai. He manifested his glory. He gave them his law with the promise of great blessings on condition of obedience. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. The people, oh, this is the problem here, see? The people did not realize the sinfulness of their own hearts. Whenever we are coming to God, whenever we are coming before God in any arrangement, we need to recognize our own sinfulness, the sinfulness of our own hearts. Now, it might be beautiful, good looking. Well-dressed, well-spoken, well-mannered, never stole, although that's hard to prove, never lied, that's even harder to prove, good and upright citizen. And there are many people, there, very often, the plan of salvation has been presented to good, upright citizens Telling them, well, you know, we are all sinners. We need salvation. You know what they say? Not me. I'm a good citizen. I'm all right. Like the Pharisee. I fast twice a week. I pay a tithe of the smallest item. I'm righteous before God. When we come before God, we cannot bring our righteousness because we have none. When we come before God, whoever we are, whatever our disposition, whatever our estate, Whatever our status, we need to recognize the sinfulness of our own hearts. That includes the Pope and the Queen. And they declared all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. A.T. Jones, the covenant from Mount Sinai is the covenant that God made with the children of Israel when he took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. That covenant was faulty. It had a problem. It could save no one. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. John speaking. That covenant, listen to how Jones analyzes it. That covenant was faulty in the promises. For the second covenant is a better covenant than that in that it was established upon better promises. The fault in that covenant was primarily in the people. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Therefore, since the fault of that covenant was in the promises, and the fault was primarily in the people themselves, it follows that the promises upon which that covenant was established were primarily the promises of the people. And that's the problem, the major problem with that covenant, the promises of the people. Not recognizing the sinfulness of their own hearts, they entered into a covenant making promises they couldn't keep. In this agreement, all the people promised to obey the voice of the Lord. They had seen, they had not yet heard what that voice would speak, but in the 20th chapter, they heard that voice speaking the words 
of the Ten Commandments, to which when the Lord had spoken, he added, no more. And when they had heard this, they solemnly renewed their promise, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. In this agreement, all the people promised to obey the voice of the Lord. Oh, sorry. What then were these promises of the people worth? What were they worth? What had they promised? They had promised to obey the voice of the Lord. Indeed, they had promised to obey his law, to keep the Ten Commandments. Indeed, but what was their condition when they made these promises? It corresponded to the condition of Ishmael in the family of Abraham. They corresponded to Ishmael. They had been born only of the flesh and knew only the birth of the flesh and so had only the mind of the flesh, but the mining of the flesh is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. This being their condition, what could be the worth of any promises that they might make to keep the Ten Commandments indeed? What is he worth? Any or all such promises could be worth simply nothing at all. Accordingly, in that covenant, the people promised to do something that it was simply impossible for them to do. So that was the main problem with the old covenant. The promises were faulty. They were not good. They were not reliable. And to show that they were faulty within a matter of a couple of days, the people had broken that covenant, broken their promise to keep it. The new covenant, on the other hand, is God's one-sided promise. Is that good? God's one-sided promise. In other words, the new covenant involves no promises from the people. Therefore, when we hear the new covenant, it requires no promises from us. What it requires of us is to trust God, believe him. That's the new covenant. God's one-sided promise. It is a promise, it is a covenant to provide a new, to provide a kingdom, a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And it is a promise to fully equip every individual, make them righteous for that kingdom, wherein dwelleth righteousness. So this is the covenant of God, this is the promise of God, this is the new covenant. One, he is going to provide a kingdom that requires righteousness. But he doesn't leave us to provide the righteousness on our own. He also provides the righteousness. He makes us righteous. Could he want anything better than that? A kingdom that requires righteousness, but a God that equips us for that kingdom by making us righteous. God's equipping us consists not just in declaring us righteous. You know, we're told that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And there are some people who understand righteousness by faith simply only in those terms that God declares us righteous. God declares us righteous and it doesn't matter what we do after that because God has declared us righteous. Is that righteousness by faith? No. No. In God's covenant, in, in true righteousness by faith, God does not only declare us righteous, but he also actually makes us righteous by infusing us with his righteous attributes, transforming us into his likeness. The entire process can be described as justification, which is our ticket for the kingdom, and sanctification, which is our fitness for the kingdom. And God has covenanted to do it all until it is perfectly complete. What a God. What a Savior. He's promised us the kingdom. He's given us the kingdom. The kingdom requires righteousness. He's promised to make us righteous, fit for the kingdom. Until we are completely perfect. Okay. The original creation. When God originally made man, he made him with a sinless character. He had a sinless body, and he was placed in a sinless environment, that is, 
a sinless earth. So everything was sinless. Man's character, his body, his environment, the earth. When Adam sinned, man's character became corrupt, sinful. He could do nothing right. You can imagine, before Adam sinned, the Lord would come into the garden in the cool of the day, and he would commune with Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve would run to meet God, like hopefully our children do when we get home, and our wife as well. Run to meet us. Happy to see us. Right? It's not like the man who, when he came home, the whole family used to come to meet him, wife dressed in her, her most beautiful, the children running, daddy, daddy, and the dog were run out, wagging his tail. And then things went bad, and the wife left, took the children, and when he came home that evening, the dog ran in the other direction. Hopefully we are not like that. But Adam and Eve, in the cool of the afternoon, when God came, they would run to meet him. Because they, they, they enjoyed having communion and fellowship and conversation with God. But then, after they sinned, when they heard God coming, they ran in the other direction. And Adam was so sinful that he could not take responsibility for what he had done. So he put the blame on the woman. What did he say to God? The woman that you gave me. Went, now, when God gave Adam that woman, after he had put him to sleep on the sixth afternoon, put him to sleep and took out the rib and made the woman. And what was the first thing Adam saw when he woke? This beautiful creature. And what did he say? He started jumping up and down. He said, no, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from man. Up to that point, Adam had not seen any creature that suited him. He had seen the lion with a female, the elephant with a female, the tiger with a female, the monkey with a female, but none looked like him. But when he saw Eve, he said, she looks like me. And she was made for me. He was happy. And he thanked God. And when he sinned, he said, the woman that you gave me. So he not only put the blame on the woman, he put the blame on God. And that's an indication of how corrupt man, came, man became. So guess what the woman did? She blamed the serpent. She too was corrupt. Couldn't take responsibility for their own actions. And that's, that's, that's what we are. We always look for some excuse. It had to be somebody else. Something that somebody said. Something that somebody did. It can't be me. So corrupt. Can't take responsibility. So a man became corrupt. His body became corrupt. Subject to death. Subject to disease. Subject to sickness. Going to a geriatric hospital or going to a district hospital, you see it. I was hearing this week about a lady born without limbs. No limbs whatsoever. And you go to some of these places, you see people in all kind of distorted shapes and sizes because of sin. We suffer from cancer. We suffer from tuberculosis. Ebola, every week a new disease coming, man became corrupt, his body became corrupt and subject to death. His environment became corrupt, the earth subject to corruption. God said that earth that only brought forth beautiful fruit and trees and plants, God said it will now bring forth thorns and thistles. And it is now subject to earthquakes hurricanes, storms, all sorts of things. Corrupt. So the whole thing is corrupt. Man is corrupt. His body is corrupt. His environment is corrupt. 
subject to destruction. What does God say? God has covenanted to restore everything. Provide a new heaven and a new earth. Isn't that beautiful? God has promised to do it. You, you bought a car, but I'm talking to those of you who have money. You bought a car for your son or daughter. And in no time at all, he or she crashes it and writes it off. You bought it for him or her, or her you know. Write off. You buy a new one? You would buy another one for them? Give them the keys and say, this is yours. Take care of it. I hear the children saying yes. Not hearing that from the adults, though. But God, this is what God will do. This is what he's promised to do. We wrote off ourselves, wrote off our bodies, wrote off the earth. God has said, I will give you a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth. What a God. He will equip us with perfect, sinless, never to sin again characters. He will do it with our cooperation. But he has said he will do it. I can hear some people saying, well, I told you so. I told you not to do it. You do it. That's your fault. Take the consequences. But God did not do that. He did not leave us to perish in our condition. He has offered completely new restoration. And uh, new heavens, new heavens and a new earth, new characters, new spiritual bodies. And those are the texts. We won't read them at this time. But we know 1 Corinthians 15, it says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised so incorruptible. For this mortal must put on immortality, and this corruptible shall put on incorruption. Then shall be brought to, pa brought to pass the saying, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The last enemy that shall be destroyed is what? Death. Immortality, eternal life. God is giving us all that back when we sold out everything that we had. This is what he has promised. This is what he has covenanted. Isaiah 65, 17, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. New heavens and a new earth. Jeremiah 31, 31, the, the new covenant promise. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. In the old covenant at Sinai, the law was written there on tables of stone. What good to me is a law written on stone? I need the law in my heart so that I will obey it from the heart. That's where God says you will put the law in the new covenant, in the heart. And I mean the forehead. That's where he will put it. So you don't need a sign written up saying, do this, do that, don't do that, don't do this. Within you will be a desire to do only righteousness and a hatred for anything evil. Then we'll have a good camp. And you will need, brother, Newton to make rules. 
in the earth made new. And write it in their hearts. And will be their God. And they shall be my people. That's what God is saying. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor. And every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them, even unto the greatest of them. Everybody. Everybody. The children too. Will know the Lord. We need somebody constantly teaching you. Because by that time, the law, the law would have been so perfected in our characters. And we will so know the Lord. We won't need anybody telling us, know the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity. This covenant com- contains forgiveness for sins. I will forgive their iniquity. Everyone, every sin, forgiven. And I will remember their sin no more. He won't bring it up to you. He says he will cast it into the bottom of the sea. He won't bring it up in your face. Remember when you did that? No. Forget it. God will, well, to use those terms, forget our sins. Because they have been completely forgiven. They have been completely forsaken. We don't want them. And he doesn't care anymore about them. Remember their sin no more. Forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. That is what God has promised to us in his new covenant. Ezekiel 36, 25 to 28. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. The water of the Holy Spirit. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. That's God's promise. So you know what? We don't have to be ashamed to say we are filthy and we are idolatrous. God has said he will cleanse us. We like to hide. We don't want somebody to know. We want to present a good face. But even if you do that, when you get into your private room with God, pour everything. Don't hide anything from him. You don't have to hide from God. Confess. If we do what? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. To forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. You know what's a stony heart? A hard heart. It is not compatible with God. It does not submit to God. It does not surrender to God. It is only hard heart. You can't get through. can't get anything done. Only hard hearted. God said, that we have those hearts within us, stony hearts. And he said what? He will take away that stony heart and give us a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, the spirit of God, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. So you don't need Some sign in the court tell you how to dress and how not to dress. You don't need a sign saying don't smoke. You don't need a sign saying children under a certain age will not be served liquor at this shop. There will be no desire for it. For the smoking. And when we go where we have to go, we will dress how we have to dress. Nobody has to tell us. No sign. No rules. No regulations, no instructions. Well, anyhow. And he shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. This land now is the new heaven and the new earth. And he shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And he shall be my people, and I will be your God. The scriptures tell us that that covenant was before ordained 
in Christ. It tells us that Christ is the mediator of that covenant in the heavenly sanctuary. Adam and Eve believed in that covenant. Adam who disowned his wife and disowned God, he held on to that covenant and was saved. Eve who disowned God and blamed the serpent, she held on to that covenant and was saved. Abraham told his wife to tell a lie so as to save his skin. Then committed adultery with his wife's handmaid. And was the household then of an, a dysfunctional family. Abraham held on to that covenant. He held on to the promise of God until he was perfected and he became the father of the faithful. That Abraham. Jacob, the usurper, stole his brother's birthright for some lentils, lied and cheated, went into Padan, Padan Aram, all of this not his fault, married two sisters. And then had children from the children's handmaids and created a totally dysfunctional family. That Jacob cherished the covenant. And through all his years of strife and lying and cheating, he held to that covenant. And that covenant made him a new man. His character was perfected. He held on to the covenant. Ishmael, sorry, Esau, he didn't cherish the covenant. Cared nothing about it. Jacob cherished it. Cherished the promises. And eventually, his faith was made perfect. Jacob's son, Joseph, spoiled by an indulgent father, so spoiled that his brothers hated him. But Joseph, in his direst moment, decided for God. He held on to the covenant. He held on to the promise. And God was able to use him to deliver a nation and to deliver his people. Joseph, brothers, can't want anybody worse than them. Hated their brother, Joseph. Were going to kill him and get rid of him sold him into slavery, went home and told their father a lie, nearly killed the father. You know what happened to those brothers? They too held on to the covenant. And the covenant that they held on to, well, the God of the covenant, brought them out of their despicable condition until when they got into Egypt. You saw Joseph putting them through those tests. It showed that they were true men. They had been transformed by the covenant. And the scriptures tell us today that the promise is for us and our children. Not just the adults. The children as well. And Christ is the mediator of that covenant. And it offers not just forgiveness of sins, but transformation of character. We are told that we are heading into the last days and God wants a people, a final generation of people who will demonstrate to the world that his principles work. We are told that this people will be the first fruits. You know what the first fruit means? In this sense, the first fruits represent those people who will reach the standard of perfection that God has always required but has never achieved before. So God has, God has people who will come up in the first resurrection who went down keeping Sunday. But they'll be saved because they abode in Christ. Some people went down trusting in God, having married several wives. The Bible says in the time of this ignorance, God winked. 
but they trusted in Christ. They didn't understand everything at that time. Their faith was in Christ, and they were good husbands. They were good men. They would be saved, but they weren't perfect in the perfection that God requires. We are told that in the time of the Reformation, Martin Luther's wife, um, Catherine von Bora, uh, Luther used to call her the morning star of the Reformation, sorry, the morning star of Wittenberg. She used to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and do everything, prepare everything, including keeping the pigs and brewing the beer. Beer. The saints in those days used to eat pig and drink beer. So God, there are people that will come up in the first resurrection who did a lot of strange things. But the scripture says, but God has reserved something better for us that they without us should not be made perfect. So we in the last days must reach the standard of perfection that God always required for his people. And what do we do? We hold on to the covenant. And he that has begun a good work in you will perform it unto the end. Take hold of the covenant. Take hold of the promise of God. Hold on. Don't give up. God is holding on. He's depending on us to hold on. Let us hold on. Trust God. The work he's begun, he will finish and will bring, bring us off victorious. So at this time, we will sing our closing hymn and pray. How many people today have been impressed with the faithfulness of God? That he is a great God, a mighty God, a covenant-keeping God who is able to perform all that he has promised and will perform all that he's promised. How many people have been impressed with that God today? And how many people want to take a stand today? Not ask you to say anything, but a commitment to show that you trust God and that you will allow him to be your God and you will, allow, you will be his child and allow him to work in you both to will and to do of good, his good pleasure. How many people today are willing to take that stand? We'll pray. We'll sing. We'll pray. We'll sing. You can join us here and we'll pray, committing ourselves to God. Closing in. Five eight zero in the old and five two two in the new. Five eighty one, sorry, in the old, five two two in the new. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Oh! 
with his covered lot and blood support me in the wild mid flood when all around my soul gives way he then is all my hope and sleep on Christ the soul in hope I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand We've heard, we've heard the message today, and we've heard about the good God, the covenant-keeping God who has made salvation complete for the worst of sinners, and he's covenanted to provide a new heaven and a new earth to make us fit, righteous for that new heaven and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. If you want to take hold, if you want to make a commitment today that you have taken hold of that covenant, either anew or for the first time, you want to demonstrate that commitment, you can join us here. We'll sing the last verse. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, and in his righteousness alone, all glass to stand before the throne. On Christ the soul in rope I stand, all other ground is in sand. All over ground is sinking sand. You know there comes a time when perhaps in our lives we have been on and off about getting right with God, making a firm commitment. Sometimes we feel the need but then it wears off. We keep putting it off. We keep putting it off. There comes a time. I remember I was at Black Rock. I had started going there. I um, was living in Black Rock, and I had started going to the church. I'd met Brother Holder and Brother Douglas, Brother Lewis, all those people. And uh, I was in and out, in and out, fooling around, doing my own thing, coming back. I remember one day hearing a preacher preach and it looked as if he was staring straight at me and preaching at me and I was sweating and not moving and wondering if this was my last chance and if God would forgive me. And I remember Brother Holder coming and talking to me straight. He says, son, you've been coming around here a long time. You're in and out. You're not sure. You're not You're wishy-washy here today and gone tomorrow, it's time to take a stand. So I'm saying, there might be some of you who have been wavering. You made the commitment and then you backed off. Made the commitment and backed off. Made that commitment today and take a stand. Take a firm stand. And we'll sing one more verse and then we'll pray. Final verse again. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, clad in his righteousness alone, for less to stand before the throne. On Christ the soul, in rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. And remember when we take that stand, we are not, we don't have to make promises to God. We are trusting him because he has made the promise. Let's pray.
Our Father and our God, today we want to thank you for your goodness to us, your love, your mercy, your grace. We thank you in particular for the promise of the new covenant to give us a kingdom when we had destroyed the one you gave us, you gave us initially and to fit us for that kingdom with forgiveness of sin, cleansing from sin, and in filling with your righteousness, your character, when in the beginning we had forsaken you and turned sinful. We cannot understand this love, but we accept it. We thank you today, Lord, that we can be here to hear such a word, such, such a message, and to understand the things you have in store for us. <clears throat> and the promise is to us and our children. So that you have provided parents with a facility for the salvation of their children, which is not to be neglected, but is to be understood and implemented. So bless everyone who is here today, those who have taken a stand, give them that firm trust and commitment. Not necessarily to make promises to you, but to trust your promise and to hold on to that promise in the difficult times, in the dark days when there seems no hope. Help us nevertheless to hold on to hope against hope. Those who are still wavering, give them a firm commitment. Break the chains that bind them, whether it's doubt, unbelief, stubbornness. Enable them to break loose, to make that commitment, to take that stand, to decide for Christ, to surrender to him, knowing that he it is that works in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Continue to bless us, continue to keep us, and continue to enable us to trust in you, never giving up, never forsaking, never letting go until that work is perfected in us and Christ shall come to take us as his own. We thank you and we praise you in his wonderful name. Amen. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. May God bless you. Real good. <laughs>